All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today for our second installment of the Justice and Injustice panel. I am Teresa Har, I'm a Special Assistant Attorney General, and I will be moderating today's panel. This week's Justice and Injustice panel is Learning with Legislative Leaders. This is a bipartisan discussion on current legislation and potential new legislation to focus on accountability, training, and hiring of law enforcement officers to work towards preventing excessive force. I, leading today's panel, we have Attorney General Aaron Ford, who is Nevada's 34th Attorney General and the first African American to take statewide constitutional office. He previously served as Majority Leader, Minority Leader, and Assistant Majority Whip in the Nevada State Senate. During his time as a legislator, he passed several bills related to criminal justice reform. In his role as Attorney General, he believes there is no task greater than the pursuit of justice and has adopted the office-wide motto of our job is justice. Joining Attorney General Ford, we have Nicole Cannizzaro, a Las Vegas native. Nicole Cannizzaro is the first woman ever elected to serve as Majority Leader of the Nevada Senate. She was first elected to the State Senate in 2016, representing Senate District 6. Nicole has spent her career in the legislature working to safeguard and expand reproductive rights, increase access to mental health services, and protect domestic violence survivors. Joining, we also have Jason Frierson, who was first elected to the Nevada State Assembly in 2010 and currently serves as Speaker of the Assembly, becoming the first African-American to serve as Speaker. Jason is also an attorney and is currently the Assistant Public Defender for Clark County. We also have Tom Roberts, who was first elected to the Nevada State Assembly in 2018, representing District 13. Tom serves on the interim committee to conduct a study of issues relating to pretrial release of defendants in criminal cases and the Nevada Commission on Homeland Security. He was an airman in the United States Air Force and served as an assistant sheriff in the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We also have Ben Kikeffer, who represented South Washoe County and Carson City in the Nevada State Senate since 2010, focusing primarily on budgetary, tax, and education issues. A former journalist, Ben works full-time as the Director of Client Relations for the law firm of McDonald Carano. So at this time, I will be asking the panelists a series of questions, including questions we have received from the media and from members of the public. These questions are designed to facilitate a conversation on important topics. They'll be posed to the entire group, and I encourage everyone to respond to as many questions as you like. We're specifically going to be focusing on legislation regarding accountability, training, and hiring of law enforcement officers, and how we can make positive changes towards minimizing excessive force. And so the first question I want to pose to the group. The video of the George Floyd incident highlighted the importance of public access to information, particularly through body-worn cameras. There were changes in Nevada's laws regarding body-worn cameras during previous legislative sessions. And I think it would be really helpful to the public if we could start off by explaining legislative changes regarding body-worn cameras and what the law in Nevada is currently. Uh, well, hi, uh, Teresa. Thanks again for moderating this panel. And uh, I'm Aaron Ford, your Attorney General. Uh, to the viewing audience, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Speaker Frierson, Majority Leader Canizzaro, who I think we lost for a second, but I'm certain will be joining us again. Uh, my former colleague, but good friend, Ben Kikeffer, uh, for reaching out. And although I never got to work with him, he's a good guy uh, that I've known through my uh, process as well, Tom Roberts. Um, I want to speak a little bit to the uh, body camera issue, but before I do that, I also want to acknowledge the fact that this panel was brought about because of prior relationships that I've had with Jason Frierson and Nicola Canizzaro, knowing that they'd be interested in having this conversation. But to their credit, Senator Keith Keffer and Senator Tom Roberts themselves reached directly out to me, offering to have a conversation around police reform and ideas to improve relationships between law enforcement and the communities in which they operate and who they serve. And so I want to give specific kudos and thanks to these two gentlemen for reaching out to have a bipartisan conversation about um, not just a conversation, but actual uh, tangible bills that will be uh, promulgated or that uh, are anticipated prom uh, um, anticipated to be promulgated either next to the set of session or during a special to the extent those things are, uh, are appropriate. So uh, again, thank you, uh, Tom, and thank you, Ben, for being good friends on this issue and for being willing to jump on. Uh, and Jason and Nicole, obviously, I appreciate you as well. Uh, to, to your question, uh, Teresa, initially about body cameras, how offers some historical perspective, and I believe it was Majority Leader Canizzaro who may have introduced the bill last go around in 2019 that uh, affected some changes to the legislation. Uh, but let me tell you that in 2015, this conversation around body cameras began, as I've said before, uh, because my son, uh, then was 13 years old, uh, had, had seen a, uh, a, a litany of killings of young African-American um, uh, men and boys. 
uh, at the hands of law enforcement. And he was becoming more frightened and asked me specifically to introduce a bill that would require cops to wear body cameras uh, because he said I shouldn't feel I shouldn't have to feel afraid to be around police officers. Uh, I was in the minority at the time, minority leader, and to the credit of the majority, they entertained, not only entertained the bill that I brought forward in 2015, um, but they passed it and they sent it over to Governor uh, Sandoval, who signed uh, the bill in 2015 that now required, that at that point only required DPS officers, state officers, to wear body cameras. Um, uh, two years after that, in 2017, when I was majority leader, I expanded that bill to require all law enforcement officers who generally have a job coming in contact with the general public. For example, um, uh, people excluded, for example, would be under, undercover detectives or people who worked at the desk. They, they weren't required to wear them. But we expanded that to include all essentially law enforcement officers who came in general contact with, the, with law enforcement to wear body cameras. Uh, and again, the idea was to, um, uh, to improve relationships between law enforcement and the communities in which they operate and the communities that they serve. Uh, not only would it be able to either um, um, vindicate a police officer who was uh, wrongly being alleged of engaging in uh, excessive force, uh, but it could also justify um, uh, the type of force that was that was being used. But it could also exonerate, or it could also um, uh, support a contention of those things, and so that uh, people in the community had a little more uh, ability to believe in the system um, when they had body camera to support uh, their allegations of. And so uh, th that's what we left it in 2017. Uh, we left the policy making to the local um, um, uh, departments, if you will, with some specific rules being placed uh, into statute. But generally speaking, it was up to the local jurisdictions to implement this. Um, you know, when I passed this bill in 2015, it was working in conjunction with law enforcement, but also with uh, the press uh, uh, and with several other entities who had the ACLU, for example. I worked with them as well to ensure that we had privacy concerns addressed. Uh, and and that's, that's how we left it in 2015 and 2017. I'll leave it to, uh, I, I, again, I think it was um, uh, Major Leader Canizaro who may have augmented that bill or amended it in 2019 to have a further discussion on that point. Yes, and hello. I uh, Sorry, I lost you there for a moment. My internet's a little spotty. Um, but uh, And thank you, Attorney General Ford, for having me um, here today and letting me be part of this conversation. I think it's such uh, an important one. And obviously, I um, was happy to work in 2017 with you on um, the body cam legislation to ensure that all of our officers were wearing it. I think it's a, a critical piece. And so often it is such an important thing for us to be able to see what officers are doing to make sure that, you know, when we have cases coming into the system, when folks are being arrested, that there's accountability there. Um, and that's a great measure that I think provides a lot of that accountability and transparency that we do want with law enforcement. Um, in 2019, I think we had some additional legislation for um, increasing the some of the use of, of body cams and I can't remember if I'm confusing 2019 with 2017 so feel free to jump in and let me know um, but you know I think um, in implementing it there are certainly and I know I've had some conversations um, you know over the last week specifically about body cameras and I think that there are some things um, that as we continue to see more usage of them, as we continue to work with how we disseminate that information to the public and, and also, you know, in the course of the criminal justice system, that there are things that we, we can do better to make sure that we have access to them, to make sure that they're being used properly, to make sure that we can actually get them, that they're maintained properly, um, that when they are maintained, that they're getting to the place that they need to be able to to get to, um, and that we're holding officers accountable for when those body cameras aren't being used properly. Um, I think that's a that's a big piece of where I think we can see this move um, in the future. And so I, I know that's been a huge piece of the conversations we've been having on just how it is that we make sure where the officers are turning them on. Um, we know that they are supposed to and they are required to turn them on anytime they have any kind of interaction with um, a member of the public. Typically, once they activate their body camera, it will start recording from, I think it's uh, like 30 seconds prior to when they actually activate that camera. Um, but I think the critical piece, of course, for the utilization of them is to ensure that those cameras are actually activated every single time. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen. And so what do you do when a body cam isn't activated? Or what do we do to ensure that those cameras that are being utilized um, are operable and can always be activated and are recording um, so that we don't lose, I think, that critical piece of transparency. And so um, I, I want to say that the legislation 
my mind is drawing a little bit of a blank. I think we wanted to expand and, and provide for some funding, but that might have been 2017. Yeah, 2017. 2017, we were working on the funding component for expanding it beyond DPS to, to essentially every officer throughout the state. And we came up with a clever solution that I think probably has to be revisited now. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you're right. That, that, was a, that was a conversation in 17. And that was with the 911 surcharge? Exactly. And Mr. Frierson, I believe you had a a comment on this as well? As well? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Attorney General Ford, for organizing this uh, and for our colleagues. Interestingly, we all talk to each other all the time, um, but I, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to show the public uh, how focused we are and dealing with what, what's going on. I just wanted to chime in about 2019. Uh, we did move from 15 to your bill, um, um, Mr. Attorney General, to 17. And I believe what we did in 19 also is uh, expanded from not just law enforcement and marshals, but also school police. And Mr. Keycapper, you had a, a comment on this as well? Yeah, I appreciate that. And in terms of thinking about what the next steps might need to be on this front, I wonder if we are now identifying a gap that we're going to have to address uh, in terms of officers who may not regularly interact with the public, who get pulled into active duty in certain circumstances, who may not have cameras assigned to them, um, and trying to figure out a way to make sure that when there are officers uh, who are directly interacting with, with the public that they may be able to be assigned to the camera on a temporary basis or something to that effect so that uh, we know all of the benefits of having them deployed uh, are accessible. I think we're seeing that gap um, right now and uh, hopefully we can find a way to address that. And one of the, we just received a question from the public. Um, I don't expect anyone to have hard data in front of them right now, but given the volume of media coverage on a national level about the importance of body cams, uh, one of the questions was, how does Nevada compare to other states in terms of our body-worn camera requirements? Do we have stricter requirements compared to a number of other states, or is there still a lot of work for us to do to catch up on a national level? Yes, Mr. Roberts. Uh, thank you. So, uh, and I can tell you that I believe that our state is is well ahead uh, based on police police agencies that embraced cameras and the legislation that we just talked about. Um, I know in 2014, a uh, part of the collaborative reform process, uh, body cameras uh, were implemented at Metro. I was in charge of the project to begin with, uh, so I'm very familiar with it. We we did a study on body cameras to see their effectiveness. And you know, right out of the right out of the shoot, that study revealed that officer complaints uh, were dropped, were lower because of the use of the body camera, which actually results in a cost savings in the long run. It's less time that you have to to spend on internal investigations and documenting complaints. So th they have a lot of benefit. And and our program, I can tell you that we were um, at Metro were leaps and bounds ahead of other agencies in the country, and a lot of folks came to to us to see what we were doing with body cameras and we implemented them. And they've, they've come a long way. They have compliance programs to ensure that, that police officers are turning them on at every incident. Now, we may need some improvements, as uh, Senator Keepepper said, as far as um, giving officers or, or, or employees that don't routinely have a, a body camera, have the, the ability to give those when you scale up, just as we saw in the last couple of weeks, you have people that work in a non-uniform assignment that are thrust into a uniform assignment and not everybody has a body camera. So I, I think we probably need to fix something there. But I think we're ahead of a lot of other places in the country. And Mr. Frierson, did uh, did you have a comment on this one? Did I see your hand, I up? See your hand up? I didn't. Uh, I, I have worked with the Attorney General when he was Majority Leader and Majority Leader uh, on policies. And I think uh, Mr. Roberts' addition to the legislature this last session going to has and is going to provide a valuable perspective when we're looking at some of the policies and in particular I think some of the policies we're going to be talking about uh, a little later this hour. Were there any other recent legislative changes that have been made that could positively impact law enforcement's transparency and accountability to the public besides body-worn cameras? Uh, 
if I, if I might answer some of that question, I, you know, I did a little research, uh, you know, last session, there was quite a bit of uh, criminal justice um, related legislation that passed through. But when you talk about transparency, there was a bill 87 that actually increased uh, public records access. I, I mean, I think that's a, that's a move in the right direction that it, that it makes uh, available to the public, uh, you know, records easily and it doesn't charge them. So I, I think that was a, a step in the right direction. Although there's a, there's a cost to local government, but I believe that it's appropriate that we bear that cost uh, because, it, it, you know, people were really asking for it. Um, another bill was uh, AB 307, which dealt with uh, gang databases. And, and that not necessarily, a, it's a transparency bill because it allows somebody that is placed into a gang database to have the ability to appeal and, and do a, they're notified that they're in there. That, and, and so it, it provides a, a due process so that we just don't uh, load a lot of people in the, to, and identify them as gang members. It, it allows them to be removed. So I thought that was a really good piece of legislation as well. I think we could probably have an entire panel on uh, Cal Gang and GangNet and um, changes that have been made and probably should be made in that one. Um, uh, Mr. Frierson, did I see your hand up on this one? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I think another piece of legislation that we worked on um, that was really important and timely was uh, adding implicit bias, racial profiling, and de-escalation training to the requirements uh, for post. And, and uh, so that was added as an re annual training requirement for officers. Um, unfortunately, uh, while we gave posts the flexibility to implement it in the best way forward, uh, it, here we are literally a year later, and it appears that no regulations have been promulgated. And so when we're talking about culture and a buy-in of this new process of policing, uh, I, I think this is a reflection of um, an effort a year ago to address this and how we need to get buy-in from the law enforcement community. And so uh, that's certainly one of the areas that I think that we need to look at moving forward to tighten, to make sure that they're actually implementing it and that they're checking back with us to let us know how that's going. Uh, but I also want to point out something that I think is important with respect to accountability um, across the board. And, and we have to think outside the box when we're talking about real cultural change. Um, and that is that we did some tremendous things expanding access to the polls. And when we talk about accountability, uh, the best way to hold public officials accountable is to make sure that we allow as many people who are eligible to vote to vote. And when we're in a time of pandemic and, in, and we're having protests now, um, there's difficulty in having access to a physical polling place because of social distancing. I, I think what we did with respect to elections um, and, and things that we can do to make it even more accessible is certainly another way to hold all elected officials accountable and hear from uh, all facets of the community. Mr. Keekeffer. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to follow up on Speaker Frierson's comments regarding his his legislation from last session regarding the post training because I think it's it's important. We, um, he, you know, in his bill outlined all of the additional issues that we want to make sure are included in training, um, but they're also lumped together as one 12 hour training block and we don't outline uh, a lot of specificity over uh, which need to be given priority um, or that each individual subject be addressed. So uh, things like implicit bias could easily just get lumped into uh, racial profiling and not, and not really be discussed thoroughly. Uh, so I think as we, as we revisit that, Mr. Speaker, it's probably important to um, be especially clear about uh, what we expect and what we want to see. Wanna see. Thank you, Senator. If I may, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think this was an example of us providing flexibility. And it's one thing to not know how many hours or how much time to dedicate towards the cause. And it's another thing to just not do it. And so I think that we see that we have to provide some guardrails and some details about how uh, it needs to be incorporated. It's been done in other states. It's not reinventing the wheel. Um, and I'm certainly welcome and an opportunity to provide quite a bit more direction in that regard. Mr. Roberts. Uh, thank you. You know, while we're talking about the post commission, you know, uh, one idea is, you know, is uh, with community policing and citizen involvement in, you know, and everything that we, we do, you know, police agencies are only as legitimate as the citizens 
allow them to be. And so citizen participation is, is huge levels of police management. And the post commission is, would be a good place for that to occur as well. Uh, currently, you only have uh, police officers on that commission. Uh, you know, we might have the ability to add some some stakeholders uh, from the community, uh, you know, on no, on that panel to provide a different perspective, uh, you know, and, and, and have some influence on some of the training, initial training and follow-up training uh, that we receive. And since we've jumped on the topic of law enforcement training, um, I think arguably some of the best tools for overcoming a policy or practice of excessive force is in the hiring and training stages for law enforcement. And so what can we do to, as we're talking about community policing, uh, what can we do to encourage or advance diversity and inclusiveness in the hiring process for law enforcement agencies? Mr. Frierson, can we start with you? Start with you. Sure. Uh, thank you. I think that's a really, really important point. Um, you want your law enforcement community to reflect the community as policing. Um, I, I think um, that it creates more barriers uh, when it doesn't. Uh, it, back in 2001, um, I, I believe a, Attorney General Ford and I were still in law school together. Uh, I wrote a, a law review article called um, uh, Racial Profiling, Protecting and Serving or Targeting the Undeserving. And one of the things that I addressed in that article was the fact that I think part of police training should be a requirement of presence in the community that you police so that you get to know your community, so that you are not uh, seeing your community for the first time in an antagonistic perspective, and so they're not seeing you in an antagonistic perspective. So we may very well have more diverse people interested in a career in law enforcement if the first officer they met wasn't because somebody was getting arrested or questioned if it was a big brother or a mentor or a basketball game or something that was steady, not just going through the motion. So I, I think that it's important that we have to look at that, but I think that we have to systemically change the culture so that we are partners in the community and not, um, not antagonistic. General Ford. Thank you. Listen, I couldn't uh, uh, agree more with, with what Speaker Fryerson just indicated, and uh, I think that's an important uh, component to anything we need to do on a going forward basis. I, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank a few folks in my office because this specific question uh, came up in recommendations. I have a handful of folks, or quite a few folks in my office who have submitted to me suggestions that we can propose to legislators on a going forward basis. And let me real quickly run the names down because it's important that we know the Tory Sundheim. Uh, that Simba uh, Mujariwa, um, uh, Richard Yen and Marie Martin, as well as Rachel Anderson, uh, Frank Tadre, Peter Handy, and Shannon Johnson in my office came up with a lot of different suggestions, and one of which relates to the hiring, training, and maintaining standards uh, components of it. And, and what they say in this executive summary to me is that there's no question that hiring, training, and maintaining standards are critical to maintaining the public's trust in uh, police officers. Uh, and that ensuring the police officers are fully equipped and to respond to the uh, many difficult situations that they encounter in the field. Poor hiring practices and training put uh, both the officers and the public in incalculable risks. So the recommendations include from them, uh, in addition to improving the training requirements, would be to establish and fund a center for modern policing uh, that would be a resource to provide specific training to law uh, to Nevada law enforcement and specifically police forces. Uh, this would be a resource for chiefs, for sheriffs, and for others to engage in modern policing, but who are limited in what they can do because of a lack of resources. It would also develop and provide training materials as well as provide staff to do training for departments. And again, I want to highlight this as, again, a practical solution that uh, I want these types of forms to, to put forth to our legislators for consideration. Uh, so, uh, you know, I will tender this document as well as this idea to our legislators and to our government for consideration, but it absolutely speaks to the importance of hiring, training, and maintaining standards of our police officers uh, in terms of the way that we interact with the community. Ms. Canizaro, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, and I, um, I think my colleagues have, have highlighted a lot of this, um, but I think that's an important piece of it is that we should have officers who reflect the communities that they are policing, and they should be in those communities, not just for the sole purpose of 
you know, doing their, their job on a day-to-day -day basis, but actually being um, part of the community itself and getting to know the people who live there. Um, and I would say, uh, the only thing I would add to that, uh, cause I think Speaker Frierson did a, a very good job of, of highlighting um, a lot of those things is that it should be, it should not just be, you know, the newest, the newest officer who comes onto the force. It should be everyone that we have in our law enforcement um, from, you know, the newest officers to the more senior, um, you know, lieutenants and, and um, sergeants and things like that. Because I do think that when you get that perspective on a regular basis and we encourage that um, wholesale, that, that we probably will get a lot better results because you get to know the community. So it's not as though um, you, you get detached from that over time. So I would just add that, you know, as we continue to talk about a legislative change or something that we can do to, um, you know, require and encourage our law enforcement to be part of the community, um, to really encourage that at all levels of law enforcement, I think would be um, especially helpful. Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, with, with community policing, you know, at, at Metro and most Southern Nevada uh, agencies, you know, every, every substation, uh, every out of the 10, each has a community policing squad that coordinates community policing for the entire station to include, we have a, an, we, Metro has an office of uh, community engagement, which does it on a, on a larger scale. And over the last few years, since we've ramped that up, and, you know, at the same time, we did, you know, massive hiring uh, after the recession. We found that all that community outreach really brought a lot of uh, folks and, 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 and diversity, which we had lacked before. We still lack it in some ethnic groups, but uh, a lot of that community outreach, you know, really, really did, did well for us. And, and I, I think you'll you'll see us to continue to do that or, or police continue to do that is like for instance the explorer program you know in your local high schools uh, reach out to you know a variety of folks in the community and, and you'll see in that program at metro there's you know almost 100 kids involved Pr primarily most of them are all hispanic and so uh or, or latino but it's more programs like that in our recruiting, we need to we need to acknowledge that we do need to to reach certain communities and and, and attract those people to hire for law enforcement. And as we're looking at expanding diversity in hiring, um, for example, now that cannabis is legal for recreational consumption, should hiring requirements change for those that have had maybe not currently under the influence of cannabis, but have prior cannabis consumption? or should we be looking at reducing barriers, which could be having tattoos or having prior nonviolent misdemeanor convictions or not having a four-year college education? Are these things that we should be looking at changing uh, in order to increase diversity populations for new hiring? Mr. Frierson? Uh, thank you. You know, I'll say this. I think in a broader context, what we need to do regarding marijuana is get it off a of Title I schedule federally. That's tying our hands and many states' hands and what we're able to do. And even regardless of what we would do locally, if we're going to get in trouble uh, with the federal government because we're not on the same page, I don't think we're furthering the cause. So I think in a global sense, uh, we need to really um, pressure our, 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 our delegation in D.C. Um, and for them to pressure their colleagues to take marijuana off the Title I schedule. Um, I, I would have concerns about certain requirements because I do believe, for me, leaving Compton, California to go to college with folks from all over the state uh, was a rich experience for me. And it gave me a perspective of people who I had never met before. I think that's a valuable um, aspect of policing the community. I was on a, a uh, town hall with Danielle Monroe Moreno yesterday with some young folks and uh, we were talking about this very thing and that um, you know you need to have a broad array of experiences um, and that's that makes you better able to understand the perspective of the folks that you're dealing with um, and so I want to make sure that we have qualified folks that recognize there's a greater responsibility when you take that oath when you get that badge uh, when you have that gun, I think there's a greater responsibility and, and I think it's our job to recruit those folks and then give them uh, the tools. Uh, you know, while we're, we're talking about it at some point, I, I think it's important that we uh, acknowledge Officer Shea um, Michelonis and the fact that this isn't just about 
um, uh, you know, villainizing the, the, the law enforcement community. This is about giving them the tools to be more effective and more supported, not just by law lawmakers, but also by the community. Um, and, and I want to make sure that it's clear. That's what we're here to do. Um, it's not really a, an, an imbalance. We're here to create a better, more responsive and more effective way uh, to protect the community and make sure that the folks that are doing it are, are protected as well. Ms. Kinzara, did you have a comment on this? I can figure out how to unmute my microphone. Um, you know, I think I couldn't agree more um, with Speaker Frierson in terms of of um, just his general comments on how it is that we give law enforcement the tools to be able to do the job um, that they do and in an effective way and in a way where the public can trust in their ability to do that job. Um, I think generally speaking, it is worth having the conversation about what we can do to make sure um, to your to your original question, what we can do to um, limit some of the immediate disqualifiers for individuals who may be interested in a career in law enforcement to ensure that we are hiring um, with a diversity in mind and we are getting folks who do represent the communities they'll be policing in. Um, and I think that, that uh, you know, the, there are some very good questions that we should be asking ourselves about whether there's a legitimate reason why we might not want someone, um, you know, to to be in law enforcement versus if it is something that, you know, maybe that particular experience, um, you know, benefits their ability to do their job because they understand some things um, from a different perspective. And I think that's an important piece and something that, um, you know, as as legislators and as policymakers and as we work with law enforcement agencies in the state, we should be looking at um, how we can increase that diversity. And I think sometimes having strict barriers is one way where we can look at it, where there may be some exceptions and, and therefore create a force that is a little bit more responsible and responsive to the community. Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, we have done quite a bit, you know, uh, 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 recruitment has always struggled from time to time, you know, somewhere around the country. And, and so at Metro, while I was there, you know, we, we made some changes to, ref to reflect, you know, the youth of today, right? You know, we, we relaxed some of our tattoo policy. We relaxed some of our, our drug policy. Uh, we didn't eliminate it by any, by any means. I, I think what the speakers talks about is probably necessary for us to, you know, to get past uh, marijuana all, all, all together. But uh, we, we've made significant strides to try to reflect our community. But I think we have to be cognizant of is too, is, is whatever we do at the legislature, we need to make sure that we don't inhibit recruitment, you know? And so, it, you know, if we make so, such significant changes that, that you, you make a job that is so difficult that, it, you know, not, not, not even is gonna, nobody's gonna raise their hand and volunteer for it, you know, and wanna do it. So we gotta be cognizant of that as well. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for you, uh, Attorney General Ford, primarily, and then the follow-up will be for the group. Uh, Nevada recently signed on to a multi-state letter asking the Department of Justice to expand the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994 to allow individual states to assume the investigative role in pattern or practice claims of excessive force by law enforcement. So can you briefly discuss that if this was approved by the DOJ, what this would allow Nevada to do? Uh, absolutely. And it's a great question. Very timely, in fact. Um, you know, listen, one of the great benefits we have here in our state is that we have a very responsive uh, congressional uh, team, uh, whether it's uh, me talking directly to uh, um, a center, uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Horsford or my staff talking to Amade's staff. Uh, we have a very good dialogue going back and forth. And what we did before we even signed the letter was to let them know that we were going to request uh, the same ability that the Department of Justice currently has, which is to uh, do what we call pattern and practice investigations. That is, if there are contentions that a particular police department has a a discriminatory um, um, practice or pattern of engaging with certain communities differently, whether they be uh, in the rules or otherwise, uh, that um, uh, the Department of Justice can do investigations in that. They can uh, request records, uh, they can, they, they can um, have interviews, they can do certain types of things that currently attorneys general under the federal law are not allowed to do. And so we've asked for the exact same um, ability uh, as the Department of Justice. It, obviously, the Department of Justice, depending upon um, a particular um, 
perspective may um, utilize that authority more than other departments of justice. And so what we saw was the current Department of Justice believes um, uh, differently in, in use, utilizing that in, in order to look into certain patterns and practice. And what I'd like to be able to do is to uh, augment um, what they're doing by being able to have uh, the ability for attorneys general across the nation to jump in where it's necessary. Um, 18 attorneys general signed on this letter. It was a short turnaround. I believe we probably could have gotten more had we had less of a turnaround, but it was a short turnaround, 18 attorneys general uh, from all over the nation, including all of the African-American attorneys general uh, who are um, in office right now signed this letter. Uh, and again, what it will allow us to do is to request information and utilize the information in order to make uh, recommendations, but also frankly, if we needed to, to prosecute uh, uh, or to um, um, require certain um, um, changes to policies and practices if we were, were to find that there were discriminatory behavior going on within a particular department. Um, now, th there will be, in short order, and I, want, I won't um, steal the thunder, if you will, of our congressional delegation, but I, I contemplate um, a, a uh, announcement soon that there's a discussion about that underway right now. Uh, and you know what, what I hope is going to happen from that discussion is that, in fact, we get that authority granted. But even if we don't, we don't have to rely upon them. Uh, I can talk to the four individuals I have on this screen right now and ask that you afford me under state law the ability to do exactly that. Don't mean to put you on the spot, but you knew it was coming, didn't you? Um, you know, I think there are opportunities for us to be able to uh, um, support our, our, our forces, um, in notwithstanding uh, restrictions at the federal level. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is this, it's not just about looking for um, you know, bad departments. Uh, this can also be used as, a, as, as an, a tool for exoneration. If there are claims and contentions that a department uh, is mistreating a particular subgroup, then an investigation can uncover that uh, actually it's not a pattern of practice. It's a, it's one, two, five, uh, you know, a dozen bad actors and um, something needs to be dealt with relative to those individuals, but your policy uh, or your practice is not one that um, discriminates against individuals or, or groups. Uh, so Teresa, you know, if there's a follow-up question, I'm happy to entertain that, but I think that's a pretty good summary of where we're looking for uh, with that particular request. No, you stole my follow-up question for the group. Um, in the event that the DOJ doesn't expand the pattern of practice investigations, uh, giving that authority specifically to state attorneys general, what can we look at in terms of a separate legislative path um, for setting up a statewide um, excessive force claim review process or a statewide use of force review process? I know a lot of individual agencies um, have their own internal investigations for use of force, but should we be looking at uh, on a statewide basis? And so I think Mr. Frierson, I think you have your hand. Thank you. Uh, and Attorney General Ford and I have, have, have discussed this and recognizing there may be federal action um, uh, to allow states attorney generals to do it. Um, uh, I, I certainly believe there's an appetite on the state level to allow uh, uh, the attorney general to look at uh, patterns and practice. But there are a lot of things that the Department of Justice does uh, that are not required, but that they voluntarily do that I think are things we need to look at. That's one of them. Another is the fact that the Department of Justice requires that not only law enforcement, but prosecutors also have annual implicit bias training. And I think that's important that both prosecutors as well as judges uh, who are making these decisions and exercising their discretion, um, that they also have this, uh, this similar training that's voluntarily done within the Department of Justice. Uh, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, there's other ways, I believe, that, you know, the Attorney General's office or, you know, other than just patterns of practice investigations, you know, so uh, years ago, uh, state statute allowed for a citizens review board. Uh, and so the, the only the only police department that has one at this time is, uh, you know, uh, Las Vegas Metro, right? And during that time, just having that review authority raise the level of internal investigations you know tenfold so i think there could be uh, a, a system in place where whether it's the attorney general's office or someone else that could actually review some of the work that is being done i mean i think sometimes people make assumptions that it, it's not being done correctly uh you know but it, it, if you have an auditor or an auditing process whether it's uh, deadly force or in custody deaths it could be a small number of cases that wouldn't really require you know a huge financial impact but just knowing that somebody is going to review those uh really steps up the game 
or actually confirms that they're doing what we ask them to do. Ms. Canizaro? Um, yeah, so uh, thank you. I, um, I would agree. I think it is worth us looking at um, at a state level and certainly there are other instances in state law where there is federal law that we have a sort of state solution for if you think about um, like employment discrimination or equal employment um, that tends to be federal law jurisdiction but we also have state laws that allow for those same types of claims um, and certainly that seems to me um, like this is worth a discussion to see if this would be something where we can have the attorney general's office um, work to ensure that those kinds of investigations can happen um, and that we can you know, hold hold law enforcement accountable, um, and also ensure that they're doing that they're doing their job. And I think um, I think that's a very I think it's a good idea, and it's definitely worth looking at. Um, just making a note because um, Assemblyman Roberts mentioned the Citizen Review Board, and I think that is um, a good example of something that puts us in the in the place where the public does have oversight over the um, individuals who are charged with keeping them safe. Uh, but I, I would like to. And I think it's worth um, having a discussion about is there are there things that we can do to make sure that that citizens review board really is utilized in a way where folks are feeling as though they can participate and they want to participate. How are we implementing that in a way where it is doing exactly what it is intended to do so that people have access to it. They know about it. Um, that that board has the, the right authority to hold folks accountable and how we can sort of um, I guess, support that in a better way and get it out to other places in law enforcement, not just with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, but other places in the state, I think, um, is another important piece of that. Just commenting on um, S.W.M. Roberts' point about the Citizen Review Board, I think um, there's probably some changes that we should consider with respect to that board to ensure that it is fulfilling its purpose as well um, and that we're seeing it util utilized across other law enforcement agencies. Mr. Kikafer? Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on the issue of the Citizens Review Boards as well. I think um, it might be time to deploy them in other communities if if um, we're seeing um, a lack of faith or a lack of trust in law enforcement in northern Nevada. Uh, perhaps a Citizen Review um, panel is um, timely here if, if there's only one in Las Vegas Metro right now. Um, if, if the county or city don't want to create one, um, that's something that the legislature can certainly require. Um, I also, you know, I went back and looked at that statute, and um, there are limited. There's there are two areas of limited jurisdiction for those boards, and one of them is when there's an allegation of a of a criminal act, or any other rights that are protected by a collective bargaining unit for an officer. And I think we may want to consider um, ensuring that any of the types of reforms that we want to see, any um, issues of review and accountability, can't be bargained away. Um, by local governments or, or agencies as a part of the collective bargaining process, that there's no sort of out um, from this uh, accountability. Thank you, General Ford. No, I appreciate that. And thank you. Uh, again, I want to go back to the fact that a lot of my, the people in my office have suggested some um, reforms that we can present. And uh, this conversation follows right along with some of those. Um, I know we're talking specifically about the pattern and practice, but we have delved into a, a few other things. Uh, and so let me mention something that my, my group indicated. And they are suggesting that we create um, something along the lines of a law enforcement and public safety accountability unit. Uh, in the Office of Attorney General that would have independent investigative and prosecutorial authority. Uh, this unit would work closely with uh, what they call the new Law Enforcement and Civilian Oversight Commission um, and its advisory boards, uh, recommendations panel, and training commissions that are comprised of individuals from diverse occupations and backgrounds. Um, that um, segues into a conversation about the citizen advisory boards, or citizen review boards. I think there's a general belief out there that these are toothless organizations that don't have much authority. Uh, and so to the extent we're going to be recreating these up north, we want to ensure that we have given them teeth. Uh, and so under the suggestions from my office, uh, they include um, a new look at their powers and authorities because they're limited. Uh, they are comprised entirely of volunteers and they don't have final decision making or recommendation authority. So the new organization that my office suggests would create an overarching law enforcement and civilian oversight commission that communicates with my office, the Office of Attorney General, uh, and that it institutes statewide policing standards and oversees 
uh, citizen advisory boards, uh, the post commission, which you've talked about a second ago, uh, and a new um, reform recommendation panel that utilizes opinions and expertise from a cross section of the community. And again, the idea would be that these entities will all have independent recommendation authority to local and to state prosecutors. Uh, these are ideas. These are brainstorming sessions that I am that, that we need to be presenting to one another for consideration. I know we're in a budget crunch, for example, and the things that cost money may not get um, you know a strong look right now. But to the extent we are able to fold in to uh, um, you know a current structure, these opportunities to make things work uh, relative to in, improving relationships with the communities, I think we should give them strong consideration. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Yeah, thank you. So you know another civilian involvement board is uh, at Metro, they have the Multicultural Advisory Council or committee, I can't, I can't remember what the last C is, but uh, the sheriff, a variety of stakeholders, uh, a lot of the NAACP, ACLU, ADL, there's a, a, a lot of folks are involved in that committee and they meet on a regular basis to discuss uh, policing strategy, procedures and, and issues in the community. and. And I'll tell you, success of it is after an incident last year, they they completely revamped the use of force policy uh, collaboratively and in work through it. The, the sheriff has adopted. They just they were rolling it out in the middle of COVID, and it just got rolled out uh, this past week. But but that's a that's a great example where through collaboration you can do things uh, and and ha and have long lasting impact. You know because if you don't. You know, if you don't have a uh, way in, you can't have buy in. And so I think it's important that the community involved in that. And and for whatever we do at the state level, if it's the AG's office or whatever, there was also a program called collaborative reform underneath the DOJ at the federal level, which didn't actually in, involve a lawsuit or it, it, we, we reformed collaboratively at Metro and made some significant strides in the, in the way that uh, police work is done. We're the first first place here in the country and it was it, it was modeled or elsewhere so operation works uh, I, I think it'd be a great idea and I uh, we received a question from the the public as we're talking about the citizen review board um, effectiveness of the citizen review board in terms of what authority do they have in the event that the review board does find that a law enforcement officer engaged in excessive force or committed an act of wrongdoing. So how much authority do they have and, and how much can they really do? You know, real quickly, that speaks to uh, the point I just made a second ago about um, there, there being a question out there as to how effective these organizations are because of uh, the limited uh, uh, authority. So, you know, I will obviously, and again, commend to the decision makers on this area to consider giving more strength uh, and more teeth to these organizations so that they have independent recommendation authority, for example, uh, to prosecutors, whether it's my office or uh, local district attorneys um, and, and, and so, you know, and other types of reforms. Uh, I'm confident that there are other examples elsewhere that, that we may look at for best practices to ask uh, what we might want to consider, but that's absolutely something that we have heard um, uh, in, in the past about uh, these citizen review boards. Yeah, uh, I know that we are getting close on time at about 11 minutes, and so Teresa, um, uh, you know, should, should we talk uh, about a few more questions that you have on your list there? Yep, absolutely. Um, so we actually received a question from the ACLU of Nevada, specifically pertaining to uh, Senate Bill 242, which was passed in the 2019 session. Uh, by way of background, one element of SB 242 pertains to the use or limitation on use of an officer's statements made during an internal investigation in a later civil action. Um, in the letter we received from the ACLU, they believe that it creates a barrier to law enforcement accountability. And so do you think that the limitation of an officer's statements during an internal investigation does in fact create a barrier? And if yes, what changes could be made? Ms. Canizaro. Thanks. Um, so I so I actually, um, I'll answer this question. Um, so SB 242 was a bill that I had sponsored this last legislative session um, that provided some, you know, supports for police officers um, in as much as it relates to their collective bargaining agreements and their um, their union representation. And one of the things um, that was part of that was that particular section. And certainly I think 
I will start with saying um, that that bill really was um, an effort to make sure that officers were being treated fairly in the workplace. I think that is part of it as well. And I think, you know, we all want that. Um, and so certainly I think that that was where that bill and the intentions of it were. Um, and so there were, I think, some good pieces in that bill. And, and I understand the concern certainly that has been raised over the use of officer statements in, in the civil context. And when that bill passed, we actually added language and I can't remember, um, there were, gosh, there were a lot of amendments to that bill. Um, but part of that was that those statements could be used for impeachment purposes in a civil suit if, a, if an officer had um, inconsistent testimony, that those could still be used um, for that purpose to ensure that, you know, you weren't prohibiting you know, or allowing, I guess, an officer to give different versions of um, whatever the particular civil case was about. Um, but, you know, I think in all of this, what has been key for for me, at least during these last conversations, is that you know we do need to have these conversations about how is it that we have law enforcement that we can both trust and also allow for officers to do their job, right? We want we want them to be part of our community. They are keeping our community safe. How do we give them the tools to be able to do that um, and to ensure that they can do that effectively? And so, um, for me, I think more than anything, this is this is an opportunity and I'm grateful for the attorney general for allowing me to be part of this discussion, certainly um, to talk about how we can make policing better, how we can make sure that there is transparency and accountability um, and do that in a way that recognizes that law enforcement officers provide a service to our community that is essential. And that, um, you know, when done, when done properly really does benefit us all. Um, and so for me, I think, I'm happy to continue to have those kinds of conversations. Um, and certainly, you know, Senate Bill 242 was an attempt to make sure that, that officers were being treated fairly in the job that they are doing. Um, but again, we're, we're, I think, in a place where we really have an opportunity to make a change um, and to make sure that our law enforcement agencies are the agencies that we can trust to keep our community safe and that we know that we can hold them accountable when that, that isn't the case. Mr. Frierson, did I see your hand up? Uh, you did, but it, it's Majority Leader Canazaro's bill, and I think uh, you know she reflected that it was intended to to um, recognize the, the sacrifices made and the difficulty uh, that law enforcement has, uh, but a willingness to, to 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 revisit it to make any 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 adjustments. I think the body is going to have to consider. Thank you. Um, we have received a lot of questions as to whether the special session um, evaluating state budget will also include questions on criminal justice reform or law enforcement reform. Um, I don't know if any of you are in a position to speak about uh, whether you think it's going to be included in the special session or uh, left for the next regular session. Um, I think Speaker Frierson want to speak. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Did you see my face uh, light up? Um, I, I, I will say this. Firstly, there, 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 there's been no decision definitively on a special session. Um, naturally, the governor issues a declaration about what can be discussed. Uh, if there is a special session, um, I would be advocating for um, addressing timely issues in a special session. And so we have a budget you know, issue that we're looking at. Um, we have uh, coronavirus, a, a pandemic issue that we're looking at, and now we have a, uh, I think, a, a social justice um, issue that has brewed up and is worthy and timely, and I think it's uh, certainly of an emergency nature that I, I would be advocating uh, to address it. And uh, I think the governor has been very clear in the last several town halls he's appeared. Tell, tell him what it is you want that we can do uh, to heal as a community, as a state, and move forward. So uh, I, I think if we continue to have this dialogue and, you know, we don't we don't call for a special session and then start talking, we start talking now. And then if we have some ideas that we can collectively get past the finish line, then uh, we would be asking that it be included in the declaration, most certainly. All right, as we are coming up to the end of our time, I would like to just pose uh, to each of you any of your final thoughts on um, 
what we've talked about today, what you would like to see going forward and any other closing remarks. I'll start with you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. So uh, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, as we move forward, you know, let, let's engage not only community stakeholders, but, you know, law enforcement as well. Um, you know, there has been a lot done in this state. Uh, you know, policing is, is reforming all the time. 95% uh, of the best practices in the country are, are done here. Uh, and I think that's reflected in some of the comments that we did with legislation and some of the things we talked about. Uh, so I think it's it's really important that we include everybody in this uh, conversation moving forward and and uh, you know and I'll certainly be there at the table. Thank you, Mr. Keefer. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Teresa, and I appreciate the Attorney General putting this together. Um, you know, I want to just say before we wrap up, um, you know, how much I appreciate the the work that law enforcement does for our state and our community. And I know that this is probably a time where they're feeling. I'm somewhat under attack, and I um, certainly don't want that to be the full, uh, oh, sorry, uh, full, uh, full, you know, the end of this discussion. Because I, I hope that's not um, where we end up, um, because they're certainly worthy of our support for all the good work that they do as well. Um, and then, uh, as we're looking for solutions as we go forward, geez, my dogs are going crazy. Sorry. Um, I'll follow up on something Mr. Roberts said earlier about public records, and we, we need to make sure that we continue to uh, push for a strong um, and effective public records law in the state so that um, citizens who have concerns can get access to um, the documents they're legally entitled to. Um, and I'm going to mute my microphone so my dog stop talking at you. Sorry. You shouldn't have it said It wouldn't be a real video conference without someone's dog in the background. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Frierson. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I just want to again acknowledge, similar to to, to Ben, the, uh, an appreciation for what our law enforcement community does. Um, and and again, um, my 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 heart goes out to Officer Michelonis's family. And and you know that kind of stuff is unacceptable. But I also think we have to recognize this is not an issue of a few bad apples. While it is just a few bad actors. Apple, I think, uh, uh, doesn't fully appreciate what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is a cancer. And when you have a cancer, you have to get rid of it or it infects the whole body. And so I think we have to take it serious and be committed to addressing it internally so that officers feel comfortable holding their own accountable because that doesn't reflect what a majority of our law enforcement community need, uh, stands for. But they need to feel safe and confident that they can do that. And so I think we need to create an environment where where, where that is possible. But we also need to create an environment where we collect data on, on law enforcement contact, on zip code. So we deal with over-policing um, where there's a larger number of officers. And then even in the court system, dealing with sentences to make sure that folks are treated similarly uh, for the same type of crimes uh, based on their background. And so I think these are all things that we need to continue to have a collective conversation, collect data and make some informed decisions uh, that best protect the community, protect, protect our law enforcement officers. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it, it, it is a, a reasonable approach that we need to do to, 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 to maintain and to some extent restore faith and relationships between the community and our law enforcement uh, community. Thank you, Ms. Canizaro. No. Uh, Senator, my dog just went after your dogs um, outside. So just so you know, he's keeping keeping the the house perimeter safe here uh as he heard your dogs barking um but uh, again thank you um mr attorney general for allowing me to be part of this discussion i think it is um, not only a critical one but an important one um and i'm just i'm i'm glad that we um were able to find some time to sit down and talk about some very concrete ideas because i think to your point um, now is the time to come up with things that we can implement um, to make sure that our police officers are doing the job that we entrust them to do. Um, you know, I think everyone here agrees that they provide, um, you know, a critical service for our communities and and certainly um, I will echo Speaker Frierson's remarks um, that, you know, our, our thoughts go out to Officer McLonis's family and, and hope for a speedy um, for a speedy recovery, and certainly also acknowledging that we have a, a problem that needs to have some very real tangible actions 
um, and ways that we can make this um, a better community for us all to live in where we all can feel safe and where that isn't dependent upon the color of your skin. Um, and I think that this is the first step is to have some of these discussions about how we can improve them. Um, I think we've talked about a lot of those ways. Um, I think that we have come up with some ideas that we can take back and start to work on. And I look forward to working with um, you, Mr. Attorney General, on moving forward with a lot of these um, I'm happy to see that there is, you know, that there was a, a bipartisan conversation here as well. Um, I think that that's important. Um, and I think that, you know, both both chambers of the legislature are here is also important so that we can move this, we can move this forward and find some real um, answers to a very real problem um, that, that we need to fix. And so um, the time is now. I'm glad to be part of this um, and very much look forward to, to what we are going to be able to do um, together. So just again, thank you for, for having us and thank you to everyone out there in the public who has been watching and submitting questions and, um, and making sure that we're asked, answering them. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, before General Ford, before you get the last word, if I could ask everyone to stay on um, for another minute after we're done just so that IT can wrap everything up to make sure that the recording is completed. And General Ford, final thoughts? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Teresa. You've done a fantastic job of moderating this, and I appreciate you. Uh, thank you to, for being my special assistant. This is this is great. And thank you again to uh, Ben and to Tom and to Nicole and Jason, uh, your, your true allies in this argument and in this discussion, and I appreciate the ability to work with you on this. Um, you know, I also want to uh, offer prayers for um, uh, for, for Officer uh, Michelonis. I pray for Shay, as the hashtag says, um, and uh, nothing justified what happened to him, and I, I want to reiterate that. I also want to um, end where we began, though, which is a discussion of what prompted this conversation, which is the wrongful killing, uh, at least in my estimation, of George Floyd. Um, it is the latest um, in, 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 uh, in, in what has become a string of um, improper interactions with COP and, law and, and the Black community in particular here. You know, we, we've talked about different strategies that we can adopt and that we can incorporate, and I think it's important for us to uh, move beyond the discussion. I, I've, I've not thought that this is the beginning or the middle of a discussion, as I've said below uh, before. We should be uh, beyond conversing and we should be actually implementing ideas, which is why I want to hear your ideas on what legislation is going to be enacted so that we can move this ball forward. Um, well, I'll, what I will also say is that, you know, we know that in the black community, uh, the level of discretion in our judicial, uh, judicial system isn't afforded to uh, many in the black community, whether it's a discretion to arrest someone. Um, or that, that a cop uh, has, or the discretion to charge someone that a prosecutor has, or the discretion to sentence someone in a certain way that a, that a judge has. And so this discussion um, isn't just one specifically related to cops uh, or related to law enforcement. It's a systemic issue that has uh, systemic solutions that are going to be required. And by the way, it's not just in our judicial system. Uh, we know that these types of issues permeate the entirety of our society, and we need to be looking for solutions to uh, handle this in a very comprehensive way. Um, I, I just want to, again, thank you on this and say, um, for those who are watching, I invite you back next Sunday at 2 o'clock, where we will have the third installation of my Justice and Injustice series. I've already gotten confirmation from Chief Soto uh, from, from, what, from Reno um, uh, City, uh, from the city of Reno, uh, Chief Andres in Henderson, uh, Chief Ojeda in North Las Vegas, uh, Sheriff Allen from Persian County, and I have an outstanding request to another rural uh, chief uh, to join us in a conversation on what organizations, individual organizations themselves have done or will be doing in the immediate aftermath of what we've seen in George Floyd. Uh, conversations will include some of, some of the suggestions that we have heard from, for example, uh, the study from Campaign Zero, uh, which includes some of the things that um, some things that some of the departments have already undertaken requiring de-escalation. I know Metro and Henderson has done that. Uh, having um, a use of force continuum, which Metro has all uh, already done as well as Henderson. Uh, banning chokeholds and strangleholds. Um, requiring warnings before shootings, which is something that I think Metro has also adopted. Uh, restricting shooting at moving vehicles, which is something that I think is worthy of conversation. Um, uh, require exhaustion, the requirement of exhaustion of all other means before you even shoot, which I think is something that Henderson has adopted, for example. 
uh, a duty to intervene, which, which, which we've seen Chief Soto already implement uh, by virtue of, well, about to implement by virtue of a new policy he's going to put into place. And then requiring a comprehensive report, uh, uh, reporting of the use of, of force. Uh, you know, these are some of the ideas that have been articulated that organizations, that individual police departments can do uh, in order to effectuate better community relations. I'm looking forward to having that discussion. So I ask you all to tune in next Sunday at two o'clock. Uh, we will have our third installment. And with that, I want to say thank you so much again to uh, Ms. Hara and to uh, Senator Kikeffer, um, Senator Canizaro, Speaker Frierson, and Senator Roberts for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.